down. The department says there are no quotas. Well, I can tell you there are quotas in the NYPD. Truly explosive allegations. They're coming from police officers who are part of what's being called the NYPD 12, who filed a class action lawsuit in federal court. This is not just another lawsuit. 12 cops willing to step up like this, because you're not going to get this again for 100 years. Hold it for one quick second. Now to record. From the beginning, I saw how this job was. It was not about helping people. It's about numbers. Who's targeted most? The minority community. Boom. And all this got dismissed. All this got dismissed. Once you start getting arrested, it goes in your record. They're taking away jobs that they could be future lawyers, future cops. Supervisors that are using police officers as a revenue-producing agent for the city. This system has to change. We all put our jobs on the line. We put everything on the line. This is something that was placed on my desk. You're still a police officer. And there are people in our community mm -hmm. that don't work with police officers, uh, period. This is David versus Goliath. Without public support, we're nothing. How long do you think you're going to keep the powder keg half on? I believe in struggle, and with struggle comes change. Can the NYPD be what cops are supposed to be? Ah, good afternoon. Um, this is 30 frames a second. As you can tell by the trailer, uh, we're going to examine uh, the film Crime and Punishment and the NYPD. And today I have with me uh, uh, Manny Gomez, who is the in in incredible in uh, private investigator who was, uh, who uh, Stephen Miang said uh, just brought the whole street vibe uh, to the film that made it more uh, film-like than documentary. And uh, Richie Baez, uh, one of the 12. Uh, now, because this is so important, and uh, I want to make sure that before we start, because I'll get caught up in this and I won't uh, say thank you to the people who, has, uh, who have made this possible, uh, I want to thank uh, Zenaida Mendez, uh, uh, certainly for inviting Veronica Kitt and then uh, arranging to have these two uh, gentlemen come here today. Uh, Veronica Kitt, uh, one of my producers, I certainly want to thank her. Uh, and I want to thank the, uh, the award-winning uh, journalist and uh, trendsetter Noel Leader because he's going to co-host this show. and, and help us along to make sure that everything is, uh, is correct and the questions are correct. So I have an all-star panel, uh, an award-winning film, an award-winning uh, uh, co-host. And uh, with that, we're going to start off. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the film. We're going to talk about the 12. I want to find out how that came about because that is a remarkable event in and of itself. Uh, and uh, we want to talk about the bill that you have been pushing all across the country, how that's going. Uh, but I'm going to defer to my co-host, Noel, to start this off. Uh, because I know that's who you really want to see. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be joining you on the 30 Frames a Second, one of my favorite programs. Uh, and then I'd like to commend you officers for the outstanding job that you have done. Uh, you've taken the role of, of law enforcement uh, to another level, um, you know, bucking the system when you see the system isn't working appropriately. So uh, what, 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 as a police officer, we'll start off with uh, you, brother. Uh, as a police officer, uh, many police officers see a lot of uh, 
uh, inappropriate behavior uh, being emanated from first from supervisors, then from officers. What motivates you? What gave you the courage to to come forward and object to? Because it's a very difficult position to take. You know, the buck. Uh, you know what's going on in the station house. Well, before I start off, I want to give all praises to my Lord and Savior Christ for giving me the strength to basically stand up to this beast that we call the NYPD. Uh, basically seeing all the evils and injustice that was being done uh, first upon our communities, black and brown, and also how that same system was being used against officer of colors within the department. So me, Pedro Serrano, Sandy Gonzalez, and Odell Polanco, we decided we need to step up our game and we had to bring everything that's going on behind closed doors to the forefront. Mm. And for the record, you are presently a, a member of the New York City Police yes, Department. Yes, I'm currently a 15-year veteran in the NYPD. And you know, uh, and, and for those who may not be familiar with this brother right here, you know, he has done over the years, I've known you to do nothing but fight for the right cause, for the cause of justice. What motivates you and give you the courage to do what you do? Because the New York State Police Department is a very powerful, very influential entity. So it takes a lot of heart to come forward and, and be critical of some of its, you know, modus operandi. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me here. And one of the motivations I've had has been organizations like the 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement, which you've co-founded. Right. And also the other one was the Latino Office Association that Tony Miranda co-founded as well. Um, when I first joined the job as a cop, uh, the first day I got on the job, I was 15 minutes. And the first thing they had me do was get in a police van, and the sergeant said, we're going to get a felony. Now, when I went to go take this ride with him, my first day brand new, felt like Captain America. You know, I was like proud. I just graduated the academy. First thing he did was he pulled up in front of a pizzeria and said, throw those three Spanish guys and those four black guys up against the wall. Now, they were holding pizzas mm. and a soda and a calzone. And we were all brand new cops in the van. The first thing I said was, um, Sergeant, with all due respect, why am I stopping them? He says, I gave you an order. Just throw them up against the wall. You'll find something. Now, I only had 10 minutes on the job. And I said, but Sergeant, I just graduated the academy yesterday, and you need to have probable cause. So what are they doing illegally? Holding an illegal pizza? Standing while being black? And um, I refused to obey that order. And from that moment on, I realized what I was dealing with, with the department, mm -hmm. that they were uh, continuously um, asking us to do things which were violating people's civil rights. And this is not what I'm about. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to do one thing, which was to serve the community. Right. And now the justice I couldn't give as a cop, I now give as a private investigator. And, uh, but I'm not against police. Right. I'm, I'm for police. What I'm against is corruption and the bigger corruption within the prosecutor's office and the judges and so forth. And this is what, you know, crime and punishment identifies. It identifies multi-levels of corruption from the ticket quotas and on. Mm. And this, I'm sorry, and this is what pains most, especially, and white officers too, because we know, I know some good white officers who were in objection to some of the policies, but this is what pains many black and Latino members who decide to become police officers. Once you become a police officer and you're all gung-ho, you want to fight the good fight, you want to protect your community, but then when you see some of the illegal practices, as you say, just 10 minutes out of the academy, and it's funny that you said that because I had a similar experience as well, being 10 minutes out of the police academy yeah. and me be assigned with an older officer, and he just began stopping people without any observation, just, and it was random. And then when I looked at their response, how they just put their hands up and allow their pockets to be searched, um, without objection, I can tell that they were used to it. So it, it pains us as African Americans and Latino who come from a lot of these communities to see our community being violated and seeing what we were taught in the police academy was inappropriate to see that happening and it being condoned. Uh, so as it relates, I, I think you had a, a, a question. Yeah, uh, 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 my question is, and uh, you uh, brought in the subject of race like mm -hmm. right away. Uh, of the 12 uh, police officers that that were involved in uh, in this class action lawsuit. How many of those twelve were white? None. Mm. None. 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 Um, in in researching this, there was a couple of phrases I uh, I hit upon. 
One was collars for dollars. Yes. And you can explain that. And the other one was uh, soft targets uh, in that how you address uh, different uh, people of different ethnicities, uh, 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 white people being treated differently than uh, certainly blacks and, and, and Latinos. Um, maybe you guys can address uh, uh, these, uh, these things, the collars for dollars and uh, soft targets versus uh, blacks and Latinos, how they're treated. And uh, what do you think the, uh, do you think any of that uh, has any bearing on the fact that no white officers uh, was down in this uh, class action lawsuit? Well, I just want to say one thing. I, I, the reason why there was no white officers involved in this at that point, because in the police department, it's a subculture. And I quote Frank Serpico, to, to get along, you have to go along. So you get a lot of these young white officers who are there who are scared to come out and do what my brother Richie Byers did and the 12 did. So this is why they weren't part of the initial NYPD 12. Now that it started, there have been other officers and hundreds of officers that have called from all different uh, ethnic backgrounds. But the bottom line is they're scared because once you put your name forward, like Richie has, once you go forward, you have destroyed your career mm. or your ability to try to move up, which you saw in the film with um, Raymond. Raymond, okay? And, you know, Raymond is defied of all, all odds and became a sergeant and now took the lieutenant's exam because he had no other choice. Because if he didn't take those exams, he wasn't going anywhere. And then the fact that all the media and the president's been monitoring what he's been doing and his successful score taking is the only way he's been able to move up. But I don't like to use the race card, but unfortunately it is. When you say soft targets, you know. Well, no, I read that. I didn't. No, no, no. But there are soft targets. Yeah. The soft targets are this, you know, like for example, Manhattan. I'm walking down by John Jay College, okay. Now here I am walking with Richie, all right. I'm a white Latino. He's a dark Latino. Can pass for black. We're walking by. We're the ones that they're gonna be considered the high target. But now the two white kids behind us that are smoking weed or maybe got a paper bag with 40 in it, they're a soft target. They're not gonna bother them. They're gonna bother us first. And a lot of the precincts we've had on film, which didn't come out, a police captain from the 122 precinct saying, you must stop blacks from the age of 12 to 21. And one of our cops said, why? What am I stopping them for? Just throw them against the wall, you'll find something. This mentality from the 70s has not left. It's still here. It's just gone underground. In the 70s, they called you a spick to your face. And now, they just do it behind closed doors. But it's still there. They'll call you a criminal, a perp. Mm -hmm. Right. And, <clears throat> and like I said, you know, when it comes to soft targets, you know, we're building the financial capital in New York City on the backs of our youths. <clears throat> we are uh, targeting them, summonsing them. Do you know that we have a judicial system here in New York, it's 95% plea bargains. So we're issuing all these summonses to these kids for anything we can get them for. We're giving kids summonses for walking in their own buildings. Criminal trespass for not having an ID in their own building. Mm -hmm. You don't need an ID in America. You can walk around without an ID. But they're getting summonses for that. Right now, this is why when we say soft targets, right? I get all these Caucasians that come into these neighborhoods, they'll leave them alone, but they'll only go after the poor black kid walking out with a school bag. And we're getting these kids and we're building 900 to $800 million a year in revenues on summonses. Mm. This is a money-baking business right. and the city is not gonna stop on it. So instead of having a ticket quota system, which is illegal now, they call it what? Uh, productivity of performance goals. Right. Performance <clears throat> objectives. And, and, and he mentioned uh, college for dollars. We all as police officers heard that term. Why don't you explain mm -hmm. what that is? College and then I want to get into some of the other illegal initiatives that the police department in 2019 and 2020 have engaged, like Operation Lucky Bag. But uh, yep. college for dollars, all of us are police officers, mm -hmm. former police officers, know what that term is. Why don't yeah. you explain to the college for dollars is when you make, you arrest somebody towards the end of your tour in order for you to make overtime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually that practice is more pra is used in high black and Latino neighborhoods. 
when you have, uh, they say you patrol, uh, patrol in, let's say, the 17th Precinct, most of the officers there, they don't call it for dollars. They do their overtime by doing patrol coverage. They say some people from the 4 to 12s called out, and they're shorthanded. They ask somebody, hey, Joe, you want to do this for overtime? And you just answer 911 jobs all day. But if you're in a heavy uh, black Latino uh, neighborhood, they want you to make, they, they won't give you overtime like that. The overtime you're going to get is summons overtime. You get to write, give out summonses. Or toward the end of your tour, you're going to try right. to make that arrest in order for you to get that overtime. And, and, and the, Can that substantiate? Yeah. Uh, and I'll yeah. get right back to you. Yeah. I don't want to cut you off. Right. Uh, but just piggybacking off of that, can that substantially augment your uh, pay at the end of the year? Uh, those kind of uh, yes. end of tour. Uh, uh, how it, much money can you? You can increase your pay on the end of the year maybe by 20%. Yeah. You can make twenty, thirty thousand dollars more doing that. And, and 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 the horrible thing about this, we're not talking about if you just so happen to catch a, a, a crime or a perpetrator at the end of your tour and you might come lock them up. We have no problem with that. But these are intentional. These are officers intentionally looking for anything possible that they can put through the system so that they can at the end of the tour so that they can make overtime. So yeah. we're not talking about good arrests. No, which just not. so happen at the end of the tour and you have to make an arrest, you make an arrest. We're talking about officers having in the back of their head when they start their tour, I'm, I need some overtime, I'm going on vacation, I want to blow my check. So somebody's getting locked up towards the latter part of mm. my tour so I can make some overtime. And, and you know, and it, you, you nailed it right on the head because as a private investigator, I've got, I've solved over 120 cases in the past six years. And out of those cases, I've had 76 of them, which fell under the category which Noel just spoke uh -huh. about. Now, out of those 76 cases, all my clients had between six and eight bogus arrests done at the end of a tour that a cop was trying to make money on, and they were all dismissed. Wow. I've got kids that got 12 and 15 dismissals who mm. go to court 12 and 15 times and get it thrown out. But the cop makes that right overtime, or we're putting it through that system, and we're generating the revenues. And I can prove to you that a quota system still exists. You want to know how? Every year in City Hall, the police department has to give what they call ComStat and the numbers. If you look at every precinct in New York, you'll see that they're generating almost the same amount of summonses, which tells you what? There still is a quota. And those summonses are generating hundreds of millions in court fees. It is a business, and it is a disgusting business. This is what prompted me to write a piece of legislation called the Department of Civilian Justice, and what you see in the film, the introduction of it, because where does this cop go who doesn't want to do that? Where did I go? I had nowhere to go other than the 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement and the Latino Office Association that helped me back when I was a cop, which started that big, giant class action lawsuit called the, um, uh, the LOA lawsuit, mm -hmm. which went caused the city to pay $26.8 million, right. the largest lawsuit of its kind nationwide. But the problem is, is that, you know what, the problem is still there. This is what we need now, legislation. We need cops like this. We have to encourage our cops to be able to speak out, to not to go along to get along. Do what's right. They're there to protect the serve, not abuse the public. You know, and this is the problem. Right. Um, I want to ask you a question uh, as, a, as a president officer, and we're going to talk about the law because, as you stated, one of the problems was uh, that there's no accountability. Yep. That officers, uh, you know, if you have a, a young man uh, being locked up 12 times and is always being dismissed, I would look at the officer or the officers who are making those arrests and saying, yo, how come you're making arrests that's constantly being thrown out? But there's no follow-up, there's no accountabilities because the emphasis is on numbers. They're not worried about quality, they're worried about quantity. Yes. Uh, but going back to you, uh, before we talk about the, the law, um, how is it as an officer to be given an illegal command or instructions by a supervisor? So we're not only talking about, uh, we're not talking about the problem existing so much with the officers, even though it is a problem, but the supervisors, the, the sergeants, the lieutenants, the captains, the inspectors, the deputy inspectors, the chiefs, all the way up to the commissioners, because they know what's happening as well. Does, it pains officers to know that this is coming from one police plaza. All of this is emanating from one police plaza. So that is intimidating mm -hmm. uh, because as officers such as yourself, you can't go to one police plaza. You can't go to the borough 
and complain about what the illegal instruction that a, a, office, a supervisor gave you because then you're punished as well. Yeah, it pains them because there's no uh, remedy. There's no uh, solution to their problems because they know if they go outside the box, they're going to get hit 12 times harder. So they was like, okay, I might get, I'm still on probation. And these are the cops that get hit the hardest, mm -hmm. are the cops that are still on probation. When you become a new cop, cop, you're on probation for two years. You can get fired for anything. You can get low evaluation. Keep on getting low evaluation. That's grounds for you to get dismissal. Uh, get bad remarks by your supervisors. Those are grounds for dismissal. Right. So now, you knowing it's coming from one PP, and you try and make a complaint, you, you're basically destroying your career. So a lot of people, like uh, a lot of cops, like Manny said, they go along to get along. Mm -hmm. So that's the fear, because even straight from the academy, they teach you that the, and your police department is a monster. Do not fight against the monster, because the monster will eat you. So they, they drill it on you for six months. So we get to this precinct, you got that mentality that, oh, let me not go against the monster. The monster is going to destroy me. I cannot beat this monster. But you know, but like, my faith in Christ is, man, God created all these animals, all these monsters to be tamed by man, to be ruled by man. So this monster can be tamed, it can be controlled, but it needs more officers like me and the public support, really. That's what we need the most. Other officers stepping up and the public support. That's why we're doing these uh, round table discussion because we want to inform the public. A lot of black and Latinos and whites and Asians, they know there's a quota system. They know there's a selective policing, but they don't know exactly the extent on it. So by us coming out here and revoicing and showing proof that we have, that there is a select style policing, that there's soft targets and hard targets. Because you know what, the soft targets, if you look at it, they have political power, they have financial support, and they're scared. You know what? Most officers, they complain in the Bronx. I won't go in Manhattan because you know what? If I just give somebody a uh, summons, they can make a phone call downtown or they can get these fancy lawyers and destroy my career. career. Think about it. These guys have power, connection. That's their fear. So they won't summons these, these people. But somebody that's in the projects, they're like, okay, this guy don't know anybody. This guy is a nothing. I can abuse him. So that comes from the top, and they push it down all the way down to the officers that's graduating the police academy. I, I mean, I had a video of a client uh, six months ago up in Queens in a 113 precinct. They stripped him naked in the street. Mm. His pants was taken down. His genitals were showing. He was in the street to frisk him. And then he went over the cops did after that. These white cops did to a Hispanic guy. Have it on film. They turned around, got in the car, and drove off. Didn't even summons him. Hmm. This is what we're going through. This is what's going on. And this is why we need to have a new agency that will bring about oversight over the police departments, not just the New York department, statewide. This is not a New York City problem. What we're addressing, my brother here, all right, is a national problem which emanated from New York. New York City is the largest police force right. in the world. So they 38% of the states emulate the New York City Police Patrol Guard procedure. So when you emulate our procedures, you emulate the problem. This is why I went around to all the states getting copies of patrol guides. So when I went to write this legislation, and I went to Frank Serpico, and I said, listen, this is what I found. They're all copying the same thing. This is why you see it in Baltimore, California, um, Newark. You see it in Connecticut. You see it up in uh, Georgia. I see it in Atlanta. I mean, and, and the problem is just being copied. They're copying our protocols, our procedures. You know, like they call it the broken window policy. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one? I forgot. Um, did he want to address the, the other new one that, they're, that they use? Um, broken windows. And what's the other uh, one? Vision Zero. Vision Zero. Okay, yeah. You want to go into that? What is Vision Zero? Vision Zero is basically uh, de Blasio's plan and to allegedly lower the death by summonsing like the 26 hazards, like stop signs, r running red light. So now, basically a lot of the promotion criteria is 
how many summonses are you issued based on the vision zeros? Like they don't want, they don't want encourage, let's say to write, let's say like your tail light or your brake lights not working. Because those are called correctables, meaning that I can give you that summons. If you get it fixed within 24 hours, you don't have to pay that summons no more. All no you have money. to do is mm-hmm. fill out an affidavit from the precinct and mail it in and show that it got fixed. So a brake light is very dangerous because you know what? If you break in, I can't tell you break in by your lights, it could cause an accident. Mm-hmm. But they don't care about that. They prefer a stop sign or a red light or blocking the box. So those fines are in the hundreds of dollars. So that could create, potentially create millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenues. And not only that, but Vision Zero does something else. It opens the door to illegal search and seizures. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me where the cops have taken him out of a police car because he was driving at a light or driving too slow. Do you know for that, they're they're, they're pulling the guy out of a car, searching the entire car, opening his trunk, flipping him over, and and you, you open up a possibility of one, the cop getting killed. The danger level just shot up to the roof. Two, you're violating people's civil rights. And then when they find they find nothing, they tell the person, shut up, get the F out of here. And this is what I've been getting on video. People send me this, not just in New York, Albany, Syracuse, Buffalo, Connecticut, Newark. Oh, I get tons of it from Newark. I've got it from Maryland and Georgia. I've been getting all time. As a matter of fact, the latest what I've been getting, stuff like this from Vision Zero, Louisiana. Mm-hmm copying the same thing and kids are getting killed because of this you know and, and then once again brother I cannot commend you enough you know I've known you for a number of years and you've always fought this good fight thank you um, and, we, and we definitely want to talk about the law that you wrote but uh, one of the I mean not only are the practices illegal not only do, do they violate the protocol or what the objective of the police officer is we're public servants by nature mm-hmm. by definition yes but it caused so much friction with communities of colors, the, the communities that are targeted. You know, um, the young people grow up to dislike police officers. I mean, it is such a bad, negative policy that um, not only is it illegal, but it causes so much problems for law enforcement and communities of colors relationships. Um, were you surprised or, or, or angered? Because Bill de Blasio, when he came into City Hall, he utilized the friction between law enforcement and community of colors as a platform that he was going to correct. Yeah. Are you surprised that there's been no correction? The problem has even gotten worse under his administration? Although the number of stops and quits, uh, frisks that they record, he claims that they're lower, but this we, is, we see it still happening in other ways. I'm not surprised. I mean, all these guys, they play in the same golf co- clubs, you know, they attend the same functions. They all know each other. They all mm-hmm. rub elbows. So what they do, they play the divide and conquer tactics. Oh, this guy's doing X, Y, and Z, so mm-hmm. I'm gonna go against it and see who, which, which flavor the public is favoring now. If the public is fa- favoring, oh, this have less uh, stop and frisk, that's what the candidate's gonna start talking about. If they start talking about we need to be tougher on crime, that's what that candidate is gonna be talking about. So it's all about the flavor of the day. So I'm not surprised that de Blasio continue the same practice. Well, well I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm disappointed because if you remember when de Blasio ran for office, he showed his son with his big mm-hmm. 1970s yeah, Afro, yeah, yeah. and he says, okay, my dad, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so my son is black yeah. and half black, half white, yeah. and I'm going to make a difference. He has not. It's been the same thing going on that's been going on for years, and Noel can say that better than mm-hmm. anyone. It has not changed. And I thought this guy was going to chance like, all right, he's got a black son, black wife, he's going to know, listen, this needs to get stopped. Unfortunately, what he has is a black privileged son who was right. not exposed to what the projects are being or the poor neighborhoods in East New York, in the South Bronx, up in the Grand Concourse that are going through. That young boy, God bless him mm-hmm. for his privileges, but he has not experienced that. He doesn't know what it is to get stopped walking while being black or walking while being Hispanic. And this is what needs to be ended. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I thought this man would bring a change and he has not. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you, you mentioned videotape that you have. It, it is certainly uh, uh, stretches uh, 
the realm of possibility that what you are privy to, uh, all of the politicians uh, in New York City, New York State, uh, don't have access to. Um, but you, you also mentioned the fact that de, ba de Blasio's children are privileged. They don't fit into a specific category of poor black and, la and uh, Latin kids who are growing up in the richest city in America. Um, there are a lot of systemic things that are designed to make black and Latinos, especially young black and Latinos, cash cows for the system. Yeah. Uh, uh, they they have implemented the uh, RICO laws. Uh, certainly, the bail system is uh, is uh, usury uh, at at worst, uh, at best, and uh, an out and out trap to uh, young uh, poor blacks and, and Latino kids uh, at worst. Um, uh, <laughs> Even, even, even if you address the issue of, of, of quotas uh, in the system, there are so many things that make it so impossible, almost impossible, for a poor black kid to move out of, uh, out of poverty uh, and change the direction of their family structure forever and ever. Because you only need like one or two uh, uh, kids in a family moving out of poverty to change the entire direction of their family. Uh, when you have kids who uh, are, not, or are not prone to crime growing up in like the projects, and the projects might be uh, uh, an area where, where uh, uh, gangs exist. Um, certainly when you grow up in an area, you know the kids that are in your classroom, you talk to them, uh, you might even uh, date a cousin or two. Uh, and now we have laws in place that literally uh, target children from, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the age of 11 or 12, and almost guarantee that they are going to be processed through the system, and their whole life is ruined. Uh, you know, you're right about that. I mean, and, and that's the problem that I'm having with a lot of these cases because you have a lot of uh, cops being forced to give all these summonses. And let me say that word again. They're being forced That's right. to push and forced to give all these summonses so they can meet their supervisor's demands, okay? And this is causing these kids to get arrested and arrested and arrested. We're destroying the very fabric of our families. We're destroying the very fabric of New York City's future because we're causing these, these kids to have no other reproach but to be able to go towards the criminal element because we have stopping their ability to get into the productive society and get a job. And this is why we need to put a stop to these quota systems. This is why we need to have a new agency to bring about oversight because the CCRB doesn't cut it. They only cover certain aspects of corruption. And then when they find a cop guilty, they send the charges back to the NYPD so they can check themselves, punish themselves, correct themselves, and monitor themselves. They can't do that. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to add, what it does, like with the top of, stop and frisk, which the Latino, the National Latinos Office Association won a lawsuit mm -hmm. against the uh, stop and frisk because a lot of black and Latinos that grew up in the inner city, they get stopped and nothing happened. Now their, rec their names are in the record book. So now when they go for, to become a cop, the NYPD, right. now they investigate, hey, you got stopped, you got 250. So, that delayed them for a few classes. Mm -hmm. So that's another th way that this systemic injustice and sy systemic racism is impacting us. Because the same kid in upstate New York is not going to get stopped. Right. A same white kid in Long Island is not going to get stopped for the same things that black and Latino are getting stopped. And also we have to go back to, like O'Manny mentioned earlier, how they're copying the New York City system. Like Comstat, Toronto, they copy this very same mm. thing as Comstack, 100%. and the same thing. Is, we went, to, I, we we went to a film festival up there, mm -hmm. and everybody there, black, Asian, they, and whites, all complaining that the cops are constantly stopping people of color. Mm. Two fifty of them stopped and frisking them. Mm. Same thing is happening in London with the scuffle, the scaffold uh, laws that have over there. They used to go black and brown communities and start rounding them up, 
giving them summonses, summonses and arresting them. So this thing is happening all over the world. Right, and you, you brought know? an excellent point where other agencies duplicate some of the practices by New York City Police Department. Now, one of the things Commissioner, Police Commissioner Owen has just left and the mayor sticks his chest out, and we definitely want to get into that law too, is that stop and frisk numbers are actually down under his administration. Whether or not they are or not is debatable, but one of the things that they do, and they still do stop question and frisk, the state attorney general is probing New York City Police Department for racial bias and fear evasion crackdown. Um, it, it was an article in the New York uh, newspaper say that New York City Police Department targets black and Latinos for jaywalking tickets. Yep. Um, we already know that there's a, 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 face, a fake operation, Operation Lucky Bag, which is in transit, where they put a wallet on the table, walk away. When somebody picks up, they lock them up for criminal possession, stolen property, when it's really not. That's entrapment. You know, that's entrapment. And it's not, even, it's not really <laughs> even a crime because you have a certain amount of time to turn over property that you find. So my point is, is there's so many operations that fall under the radar that our pe members of our community don't know about where the police department is targeting members of our community, not engaged in any criminality. And, and for the life of me, you know, uh, generations after lawsuits were filed and won, you know, they still engage in these practices, targeting uh, our communities, because like you said, they feel that our community doesn't have any any support. These individuals don't have any support. They don't have any power. So generation after generation, administration after administration, they still institute these abusive, overtly aggressive, nonsensical policies targeting black and Latino. I mean, and, and you know, you just nailed it right on the head. Operation Lucky Bag. Uh. How unethical and duplicitous and disgusting that is that we're going to go put a wallet in a real poor area nice. so we can tempt these kids to pick up that wallet. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that on Park no. Avenue, on, on Park Avenue South, right. on 23rd Street. They're doing that in East New York. They're doing that in Astoria. They're doing that on the Grand Concourse. All right, this is where I have a problem. They're not doing that on Staten Island. Right. All right, you know, we are setting up our children for failure and we're building revenues off these families. Mm -hmm. This is appalling. A change needs to be done, nice. mm -hmm. all right? And I'm glad that you know you nice. give us the opportunity to express this, because a lot of people don't know about, like Noel said, Operation Lucky Bag. Right. Nice. They don't know about the quota systems. They don't know what's going on. One of the most outrageous operations I've ever heard as a police officer in my life. When I first heard about it, a brother gave me a, a, a complaint report. I couldn't believe it. I gave it to the New York City Liberties Union. They couldn't believe it. He went straight to the district attorney's office. When the district attorney looked at it, he says, Yo, who's doing that? I can't believe it's being done. But these cases were being wow. arrested. They were being okay by the supervisor. They were being okay by the district attorney. The judges were entertaining it. So it was systemic corruption. Mm -hmm. You can look at this and see that this is not a crime. This is found property. And they didn't even give the person, whether it was a wallet, whether it was a radio, sometimes they even put radios in transit. And they, and they just left it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the bench. And if somebody picked it up and walked away, they would arrest them. But you want to know something else that they're doing because of this Operation Lucky Bag? There's a police procedure called avoided arrest. So now what they do is they'll bring in Richie Baez here for picking up that wallet. Then they find nothing on Richie, right? They'll avoid the arrest. Now the arrest is voided for robbery or theft. And then it's kept in the hidden, and let me say that again, in the hidden record second section of the NYPD in one police plaza. Now they keep those records, but now the court doesn't know about it, neither does the state system, because he wasn't put through the system. He wasn't fingerprinted. He was not, had an accusatory instrument generated, brought to in front of a judge. So since all that never happened, when you run his name through the state system and the federal, it comes up clean. But now he decides to apply for a job as a mm. correction officer, as a U.S. Postal Officer, as an ambulance, as a fireman. Okay, and guess what happens? He writes an application, well, never been arrested, mm -hmm. right? Because they released him and said, you know, go about your way, get out of here. He just lied on the application. Mm. He didn't put down that he had avoided arrest. Now they generated that voided arrest which violates the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment states you're supposed to tell a person of charges generated against you. It's illegal. All right, that's why the Sixth Amendment was created because the British would do that to the Americans. They would hold you in jail for six months and not tell you what you ever got arrested for. Except now we're doing this. It's a very powerful uh, weapon of discrimination because you can target blacks and Latinos and stop them from moving forward. You can stop them from moving forward by destroying their careers without them even knowing it. And you know how I found out about this? 
All right. Do you remember the uh, Diallo uh, mm -hmm. demonstrations? Right. Okay. The Diallo demonstrations. They were they arrested right. council members. That's right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks got arrested. Right. Jerry Nally Everybody. got arrested. Serrano. Yeah. Well, guess who ran their record? You did. <laughs> I did. And I found the voided arrest. Yeah. And that's how I found that they had, and then I brought it to them. And they didn't know. And they didn't know. And I wrote a bill called the, the uh, Clear Expungement, Name Act yeah, Expungement Legislation back right. then. That was me and Noel going to Washington. And that was primarily you. We were following oh. your lead. Oh. Oh, thank because you. Because we didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we went to Washington, and that's why right. I said I give my, my, my loyalty and appreciation to the 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement and to the Latino Officers Association because they stood by me at a time when nobody would. I was the la only man that would speak up mm -hmm. against this. And when these guys heard it, I'll never forget, no, I was like, what? They're doing what? And it's, a, and it's in the police patrol guy procedure. It tells you to do this. They don't tell you they're giving you a record. So now when you apply for, let's say, to be a lawyer, it says, have you ever been arrested? Now when it, you check, no, because they sent you home that day, you weren't put through the system, and now 10 years, 20 years go by and you become a lawyer. But guess what happens? When they do your background check, they run you to the federal system, you come up clean. They run you to the state system, you come up clean. But you live in New York, so they contact the local municipality and say, oh yeah, this guy in the world leader was arrested for a, a wallet robbery on a, a number six train. Mm -hmm. But it says voided, defendant did not commit crime. And there's no fingerprint number. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look how you can destroy a life. So uh, having said all of this corruption, and this is, it, it is so unfortunate that all of this that we're talking about emanates from law enforcement. This is who the public should have confidence and trust with. This mm -hmm. is the criminal fighting appara apparatus of police officers in our city. Um, we should come to police officers to resolve all of these issues. Um, there's a movement uh, I, that you initiated to start an um, a entity in government, the Department of Civilian Justice. Uh, you see that as a way, and it's a very good idea, and I know it's in the, presently in the state assembly, an uh, agency that will sort of be like a checks and balance to all of this law enforcement corruption. And it, it, it seems like that, should, that law enforcement and corruption shouldn't even be in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. But why don't you explain to uh, those who've never heard of it the, your proposal uh, for the Department of Civ uh, Civil uh, Civilian Justice? Well, um, again, as I said, when I became a private investigator, I started realizing all these cases um, and I started seeing all the injustices and all these families telling me the same story. Where do we go to report the prosecutor who lied in my son's case? Where do we go to report the police officer who lied in my son's case? Where do we go, do we go to the, cor the cor correction officer who stuck his hand down my panties when I was going to go visit my son? Where do we go? We keep calling 311 and nothing happens. It's a broke system. So then I started realizing, you know what? I want to write this. So I came up with a bill. I went to a guy named Frank Serpico, and um, I told him, I said, Frank, you got two choices. You're either with me or you're with me. <laughs> <laughs> and he started laughing, just like you. He says, kid, you got to pay. You know? And uh, I showed him the bill. I said, uh, when you look at it, will you write on it? And tell me what you think and add to it. And he did. And what this does is gives the cops the ability to report corruption without fear of retaliation. It gives the public the, the chance to now go to an agency who will investigate their son's case fairly by investigators who are not cops, who are not lawyers, who are not district attorneys, regular smart students from like Columbia, Harvard, Yale, NYU, BMCC. All right, we take the cream of the crop. And then what they do is they train them to become investigators so that we can give the people a fair and impartial investigation. Not only that, but it gives the cops, the police, the ability to not fear of speaking out against corruption. <coughs> and that's the problem. This is what Serpico asked for in the 70s, except he asked them to do it with nothing, right. to create something from nothing. Now me and Frank put this together where this bill now gives them something and now, finally, we got it from a proposal to a state bill, Department of Civilian Justice being sponsored by Assemblywoman Natalia Fernandez. But I need everybody to come support us. I need them to come to the hearing so they can come out and speak out. All the black mothers, Spanish mothers, Italian, Irish, Jewish, 
all mugs, because this transcends color. You know, we talk about cops and corruption, but I found as an investigator the most corrupt individuals in New York State are the prosecutors. Mm. The assistant district attorneys lying under oath, holding back evidence. Do you know when a child is going to court and they're trying to defend themselves for, let's say, a robbery case, the district attorney will wait till the last day before trial and then submit all the documents to the defense attorney so they can prepare a case to defend themselves. Yeah, it's called a blindfold law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's the problem. Mm. They're, it's called document dumping. And they'll, so they make it so that you can't even have a fair chance to defend yourself. This is America. This is not the country that I swore an oath to. But I believe in America and I believe in justice. And I know the one greatest thing that we have in America that makes us, no country is perfect, but makes us one of the best countries is we have more laws on the books to protect rights. And we have the greatest ability in America, which is our First Amendment, which lets us write a bill to petition the government to correct grievances. That's why I'm not a lawyer. I went to the New York Public Library, the Ghostbuster Library on 42nd mm -hmm. Street and 5th Avenue, and I asked them, how do you write a bill? They mm. gave me the books to write it, and that's what you're holding there. Mm. And then Serpico wrote with me as well. But I want to say everybody can do that. I want everybody to start knowing their rights. And, and, and don't, you know, we're not, we're not against cops. Are you against cops? No. <laughs> Neither am I. It's a, we're against corruption. It is a big difference between being a pro-cop and being pro-department. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand that being a cop and a police department are not one and the same. Right. We're yes. two different entities. Mm -hmm. And that's when, once the public can understand that we are two different entities, because a cop wants to do the right thing. They want to help the public. They want to catch the bad guy, the drug dealers, the murderers, the rapists, the pedophiles. They don't want to give a 16-year-old kid a summons for riding a bike on the sidewalk. Right. We don't want to do that. But the department, that's what they want because they have to generate revenue for the city. Because I, I had this uh, executive officer tell me, listen, the, my, the police department is a corporation. We always need to keep revenue high. So we always have to continue writing summonses mm. in order for us to succeed. And then you go into the, uh, the, the prison system. It's a $3.2 billion a year mm. system. A lot of money is being doled mm -hmm. out. And all these uh, cities that have a prison, they get a lot of funding for having that prison there, which create jobs in those areas. At the same time, since they have a prison population there, the people that are located in that, in that prison, they get counted towards the census. So now they get money from the federal government for that, while the neighborhoods they're being dragged from are getting less money. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so now the question becomes, are we, is this a criminal justice institution or is it a money generating institution? Well, and what, it's no such thing as a criminal justice system. It's a legal system. Mm. So that's so what now, we Is have. it a legal system or is it a money generating system? It's uh, both because they legally created a system right. to generate money. All right, so let me ask it again. Is it a legal system? Is it supposed to be a legal it's system? To be a legal or is, system. It's not supposed to be a money generating system, but that's what it's become. And like you said, a police officer whose who's, who eyes are wide open, who puts on a uniform for the first time, wants to go out there and save the world, now he's being conditioned to go along with the, with the machine and make money by any means necessary. And if you're told, listen, come back with five summonses, or else there's going to be some negative ramifications. If you get desperate, you're going to write a summons to whomever, whether that they're guilty or innocent, whether it's a borderline, whether it's something that really shouldn't be enforced. So that's, that's, where, that's where it becomes such a negative uh, uh, thing. It, you know, that we thing. can prove that, too, because you look at all the dismissals. Yeah. Each, bro, oh. it's staggering. Yes. It's in the yes. thousands. Right. Yes. Pieces, right. People's right. cases are being right. thrown out because right. the judge realized that this is garbage. Right. right. You yeah, know? yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, and nothing's uh, being done. That's a good point. And Richie specifically used the 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 word corporation. Uh, it has been my experience that once you uh, use the word corporation, everything else is circumstantial. Mm. Uh, uh, Making money becomes uh, number one. Uh, mm -hmm. th that is the only thing. That is the only thing. In a corporation, in a corporation, there is only the bottom line. 
uh, uh, nothing else. Everything else is just circumstantial. You know, it's not even secondary. It's tertiary. It's it's uh, there is no secondary. It's money and space. Then everything else. <laughs> yes. uh, um, um, and um, one of the one of the points I want to make because uh, uh, we want to keep this somewhat personal. Um, one of the things I have found uh, to be true is that when you have black and Latino officers, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to have black and Latino children and grandchildren <laughs> and nieces and nephews. Uh, so even though you are a member of uh, law enforcement, uh, when your children get out there, a lot of times they are subject to the same types of, of issues and incidents that, uh, you know, schmuck like me uh, 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 would encounter when he sends his kids out to school and whatnot. Um, so there is a, a personal uh, motivation for trying to correct a system that has gone this far off the beating track. Uh, uh, yeah, as I could tell growing up in Spanish Harlem that I had officers, Latino officers, call me, I'm a dirty Dominican because I'm a drug dealer, so forth and so on. And I'm like, okay, I won't become a cop, but do I have to act like this guy? Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I, got, I met two Italian officers up in Washington Heights in the street fair that the way they treated me with such respect and humanely, not only me, but my family, everyone around, that I said, I'm gonna be like these two guys. That's when I realized it's really a choice on how you're gonna treat their community. Mm -hmm. that you police. It's what? not, so with that choice, I made a conscious choice that I'm gonna come and help. I'm mm -hmm. gonna do everything possible I possibly can right. to help this person. You know, and my son is of color, all right? My, um my baby's mother, all right, is um, like Beyonce. Nice. Looks like her. Nice. Right? My son is Caramel. Very and nice. I, I'm very lucky. <laughs> um, yes, you are. <laughs> but I do this personally because my son has been stopped for walking down the street. And I'm going to say that. My son was walking down the street hmm. holding a textbook. Actually, he was holding uh, The Art of War. Book that I gave wow, him. Wow, wow, right. son too, yeah. yeah. And uh, my son got stopped for that, thrown up against the wall. First, they went into his private areas. Now, my son wasn't given a summons. Then they just told him, okay, you can go away. You just fit the description somebody was looking for. You're not supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. This is why it's personal to me. This happens to thousands of people in New York City every year. Mm -hmm. And it happens across the United States and something needs to be done. Right. So this is personal yeah. and, you know. Yeah, I want to get back to, to you and, and I thank you for that um, because it is personal and all of us, like Nat says, we have family members. Mm -hmm. This happened to all of us. So we're, you know, we get both sides of it, the law enforcement. But going back to this uh, real quick, the right. Department of Civilian Justice yeah. bill that you wrote, um, some people will say, well, we have the um, CCRB. But the, the unique <coughs> and the genius about this particular bill is it has teeth. Yeah. Why don't you explain about the teeth and well, then explain to the public where it's presently at and what, you know, well, what are you interested in The Department forward? of Civilian Justice, uh, this new agency, well, has the ability to give a regular poor mom or any other color of any nationality to go make a complaint against the prosecutor, police officer, or Department of Corrections. And also it gives the ability for the investigators who will work in the Department of Civilian Justice the ability to investigate any agency and if any agency denies them evidence, they will have the ability to suspend mm. the police commissioner, the district mm. attorney, or the assistant district attorney. Not only that, but they're also going to be able to hold real trials, administrative trials by real judges who are not affiliated with any police department, who are not affiliated with any prosecutor's office, and they will give a fair and impartial investigation and have the ability to fire the police commissioner. That's important. To fire the district attorney or the assistant district attorney. And the officer. And the officer. But not only that, but it also gives the, the, the officer the ability to report his sergeant who is ordering him to stop black people for no reason or to stop these white people mm. for no reason. 
So it takes away the fear from the cop and it gives them an ability to go somewhere and say, hey, this is what's happening. Can you please look into it? And now the police department is very well known and Noel knows this better than anyone for hiding information. They won't give it to you. Even if you go in there with subpoenas, this agency will not have the ability to suspend anyone on the spot who does that, mm -hmm. who tries to interfere, even if it's the police commission. So in essence, this will be the first time we have an, a government agency which will have complete accountability over everyone. And, and it also you will put in there that if they retaliate against somebody who comes forward, yes. they could be charged by this criminal yes. justice. And they can, so now if they do like what they did in the uh, movie Crime and Punishment where you see the cop getting uh, a summons, I mean, being put in the books for wearing a hat when it's cold, or, or the black officer, uh, Edwin Raymond, being ostracized because he showed discretion and let a guy go. All right, now if they Photo retaliate. Photo of a rat. Well, yeah, and they retaliate against him. Now he can go there and have that sergeant suspended. In the movie, you saw the sergeant say, I was told to give you a bad evaluation by the lieutenant because you're a young black man who has very strong words and who's educated. Mm. How dare you be mm. a young black man educated mm. with a vocabulary? That's what scared them. And that's what the black sergeant told the black officer that he's taking orders from the white lieutenant to screw him. Actually, from the captain. And from the captain, the I'm white, sorry. The, the white captain that he's been known for years to just discriminate against black and Latinos. That same captain came on the news saying, don't stop white, I mean, don't stop whites and Asians. Like one particular officer, Officer Birch, he pulled him to his office, office, not because he had low numbers. He said he didn't stop enough blacks mm, yes. or Latinos. We got 30 seconds left. Where's the movie? How can we see the movie? Hulu. Hulu. Go on Hulu, Crime Plus Punishment. And then if you can, uh, go online, Department of Civilian Justice and the State Legislature. And if you can, look us up at uh, uh, Black Ops by Investigators. You can download the bill. Please come with us to uh, Albany. Yeah. We need everybody to support us so we can make a change for all of us. Uh, wow, I could keep them here forever. Yeah. Uh, uh, we uh, just about this, run uh, out. part two then. Uh, <laughs> part you two. have, a, you have an open invitation, <laughs> an man. open invitation uh, to be able to bring this kind of information to, uh, to the, uh, my community is a godsend. Thank you. Um, take us out. Say good night, Grace. Uh, well, you know, we appreciate the work that you've done. And uh, I mean, this brother is, is icon. There should be a statue of him somewhere, oh, uh, you, you know, so, because he's done you. so much work and, and, it's, and it's of his own labor. But we appreciate you. We appreciate uh, Nat for coming uh, with Information TV. We appreciate you all viewing audience. We see you next week, uh, 2 o'clock. You 30 frames it. a second. You got it. And 5 o'clock, community cop. <laughs> you know. Community cop. <laughs> and we thank you, uh, brother, for your sacrifice and all the work. We know it's not easy. I know it's not easy because I was where you were at one time. But we thank you for your courageousness and your commitment to, to uh, your craft, a law enforcement officer who was sworn to protect and serve the New York City residents. Well, we thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to explain this. Oh, you and guys are amazing. Out. Thank you. you guys are amazing. You guys are just amazing. You ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Guys, be my brother. All right. Peace. We out.